What's up, fellas, and welcome to May 2022's coaching video for Proverbs Triple X Club. I'm uh, glad that you are tuning in this month. Going to have some fun this month as we do a little digging in the scriptures. As always, I want to say thank you for taking the time out to watch our coaching videos. Um, I trust that these coaching videos are uh, helpful, uh, that they're encouraging, that they're instructive. Um, even enjoyable, uh, the resources that we put out that um, I create and, and put out through uh, either YouTube or on our website or through our Patreon um, page uh, is always intended to help, to be a blessing, to encourage, to challenge, um, not only for you, but also for me as I make these. Um, it's very convicting uh, to think through these things and, and look through some of these things. So again, uh, I hope you're encouraged by them. Um, as always, as we get started, uh, I want to encourage you to have uh, your Bible out so you can look at some of these things. As always, uh, pause the video, uh, take time to look through the scriptures particularly, um, read through these things, um, make notes of these things, memorize on, uh, memorize these verses, meditate on these things. Those are always helpful. Um, and then just take notes um, in your journal uh, if, you, if you like field notes like I do, it's particularly if you like to use pencils, um, black week pencils are always a good investment. Um, but take notes um, in, you know, not only when you're watching the coaching videos, but in your devotions, in your personal time, your free time as you read and study. It's always helpful to take notes. Um, most of my coaching videos and a lot of the devotionals um, are just the overflow of a lot of personal reading and studying and I have um, notes uh, and notebooks full of just things that over the years I've wanted to flesh out in different ways and so that's how a lot of these things come to you. Um, sometimes it's in response to different things that are happening in the world and in society culturally like, like this month's coaching will be somewhat of a response to things that um, keep coming up again and again and again. And then other things are just uh, personal things that come through through life and ministry in different ways. So, uh, so go ahead, make sure you got your Bible uh, notes, you know, something to write with, something to write on, and we're going to dive in. This month, I want to talk to you uh, about something that I call patriarchy and the thousand generations. Patriarchy and the thousand generations. Um, patriarchy is a buzzword in today's very um, politically charged climate. Um, it's a bad word. Uh, it's very common to hear things like down with the patriarchy, um, people blaming all their problems on the patriarchy. Um, the patriarchy is seen very, very negatively, particularly in a very liberal worldview, um, in, a, in a liberal political spectrum, um, feminism. Uh, it's quite common to hear it uh, creep up in the church um, in a lot of circles, um, patriarchal, Ideas, views are still very, very negative. Um, even in the past uh, week, I um, heard, uh, I believe it was Representative Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez, who blamed the horrific situation at the Uvalde Elementary School shooting. Um, she, she ended up blaming it on patriarchal society and predatory men. And so it's something that we hear all the time. Something bad happens, it's the fault of the patriarchy. So I wanted to take some time this month and address the idea of patriarchy and, and take a few minutes to talk about it. Like always, this is not an exhaustive list. There are many more things we could add to this. As I began to work through this, I started adding and adding and adding and adding more. And at a certain point, I had to start cutting things out because this is never going to fit in a 30 to 40 minute video. So I just want to address some ideas. Um, so today we're going to define uh, patriarchy, what it is. I want to show you why it's a good thing scripturally uh, and we're going to see how the Lord is going to use it because he has been using it to bring about his eternal and intended purposes in the world uh, for us and for all of history, for for the people and the tribes and the, and the kindred and the, and, and the tongues and the nation that, that God is building for himself throughout the world. Um, uh, he's been using the structure of uh, the patriarchy and our patriarchal societies uh, and they're good things, no matter how the world may look at them today. A patriarch is a good thing. I'm glad to be a patriarch. Uh, so let's talk about it. Number one, what is a patriarch? 
if you look at Webster's definition or Oxford's definition, just your normal dictionary, you're going to get something like this. Uh, first of all, a patriarch is the male head of a family or a tribal line. Um, it's a, a person who's regarded as the father or the founder of an order of a class of people, the leader of a group of people. Um, and specifically speaking of any of the very early uh, personages, or characters, um, regarded as fathers of the human race, um, comprising from people from Adam to Noah, uh, the, the pre-flood patriarchs, and then between the flood and the birth of Abraham. Uh, and specifically when you talk about patriarchs and look about patriarchs, when it comes to matters of faith, we're talking about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Um, so a patriarch then is the male leader of a family, the male leader of a tribe. Um, and we can look uh, throughout history and see how patriarchal societies have been formed and, and they, how they have formed and shaped culture around them. There have been a few uh, matriarchal societies um, historically, um, and even you see that you might see in the world today, but the overwhelming majority of society and culture um, historically has been patriarchal and it's set up in, and we believe as Christians that that's not only God ordained and designed, but that's a good thing. Um, and, and particularly as we look at this today, I want to make sure that we understand that, that that's all it is. Um, the male leader of, of a family, a group of people, um, and, and instead of this horrible, wicked institution that's the, the cause of every evil in the world today. So I want to make sure that, sure that when people say down with the patriarchy and when we you know are all about the rise of the patriarchy, that we're talking about the same thing um, and, and make sure that you fight for those things and we fight for the meaning of words and we, we fight for what's good and we fight for what's right instead of just being silent and let people raise their voices, uh, opening their mouths and just uttering foolishness. Um, so as we have the idea of patriarchy in mind, that's what we're talking about. The male leader of a family, the male leader of a tribe, the male leader of a group of people, the male leader uh, in whatever your setting is. And so that's what a patriarchy is. now. The next question uh, we didn't have to address, and maybe even first and foremost, um, is what does the Bible say about patriarchy or patriarchs? Uh, it's not a word that is used much in the Bible per se. We do see it, um, but it's not hundreds and hundreds of times. Uh, we don't see the, the, the Hebrew word uh, exactly like we, we see the Greek word. It, the Greek word even looks like patriarch. Um, but the New Testament does use the word patriarch several times. And uh, I just want to look at one passage um, very, very quickly. Um, this is Stephen's defense of his faith. This is the sermon that, that got Stephen killed as he was stoned. And then all the garments of those stoning him who laid their garments at the feet of the Apostle Paul. Um, Stephen, in his defense of the faith, in his sermon, he says in Acts 7, 8 through 9, says, And he, God, gave him, Abraham, the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham became the father of Isaac. And circumcised him on the eighth day, and Isaac became the father of Jacob, and Jacob of the twelve patriarchs. And the patriarchs, jealous of Joseph, sold him into Egypt, but God was with him. And so uh, we see that the Bible defines and, and gives us patriarchs just like we would in any normal definition. These leaders of families were specifically not just leaders of any family, but but the progenitors um the, the founders of lines of people and of, of families, of tribes. And, and so we trace our heritage, our lineage of our faith in Christ all the way back to Abraham. We can trace that back to Noah. We can trace that back to Adam. Uh, and so these are lines of people that have come from men. Um, and men are responsible to not only physically bring about uh, these families, but also spiritually bring about these families. And so we're going to see um, what that means and what that looks like. So that's that's basically what a patriarchy is: uh, a male leader, a male founder, um, a, a, a male um, father, husband, someone who's starting a, a line and a family, a group, a tribe, a people. Particularly, um, as we want to faithfully represent um, our Creator and our Redeemer as patriarchs uh, over the ones that God has placed under our control. Um, second thing I want to look at after just a brief definition is, uh, and this is probably the, the lengthiest portion of our coaching this month, is simply this. What are the roles and responsibilities of a patriarch? Um, as we look at the scriptures, understanding that, sure, we are leaders of families, founders of families, um, responsible for families, 
Um, what do those responsibilities entail? What, how do we flesh this out? Uh, what are the, the daily, weekly, monthly um, things that we have to be doing as patriarchs? Uh, we, we look back at the scriptures, particularly focusing on Abraham because God specifically starting a line uh, people, um, namely to bring about a redeemer, to fulfill his promise to Adam and, and therefore fulfill his promise to every man who's lived since Adam, to fulfill the covenant he made with Adam and then, uh, and then Noah and then Abraham and, and, and Moses and David and others. Um, God faithfully brings a redeemer through a line of people um, that God started when he called a man. And so God separates and calls Abram in Genesis chapter 12, makes a covenant with Abram in Genesis chapter 15, makes a promise to bless him above all others who will come after him, changes his name to Abraham. He said, it's no longer good for you to be called Abram, which means exalted father. He changes it to Abraham, which is the father of a multitude or father of many nations. And so in and through Abraham, uh, we see this blessing uh, and we see um, what only, not only what God requires of Abraham, but what God requires of all patriarchs. Um, as, as we are kind of sub-patriarchs under our father Abraham uh, and what our responsibilities are for our household. So that's what we're going to look at for a few minutes. So what are these roles and responsibilities? The first one is to command your household. Um, there's a great question that God asks in Genesis chapter 18. Um, whenever God asks a question that's really interesting, um, number one, you have to start asking yourself, who's God talking to? Who's God asking uh, this question too, uh, in this sense, uh, it's, it appears to be a conversation with the Godhead itself. But in Genesis 18, 17 through 19, it says this, The Lord says, Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him? For I have chosen him, right? Um, God's choosing of Abraham, separating Abraham out from the rest of the world, from the people uh, in the Ur of the Chaldees, um, he chooses Abraham, separates him. He says, I've chosen him that may, he may command his children and his household after him. Uh, so the first responsibility of a patriarch is to command your household. Now, one of the problems we have with the patriarchy and the down with the patriarchy people is that this obsession that if someone is in command, that if someone has authority and that there are people under that person, that that automatically assumes that we have a bad leader. There's almost uh, as, as if it were a modern assumption that all leaders are bad, all leaders are evil. If someone's in charge, they're a bad person in charge. Rather than the simple fact that because people are in charge, there's an opportunity for that leader, whoever is in charge, to be either a good leader or a bad leader, um, a good patriarch or a bad patriarch. And the world has seen loads of both historically. Um, but he says, I want you to command your children and your household after you. Um, talking to himself, he goes, I've chosen Abraham so that he may command his children and his household after him. And here's specifically the command uh, we see in verse 19, to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what is promised him, namely all the promises of the covenant, right? Including most particularly the Redeemer, the Savior of the world, who is the promise of Abraham. And through the Redeemer, that's how God is going to bless all of the earth through Abraham. And so the first role and responsibility is to command your household. And it's your it's to command your household, specifically not being a jerk, sure, um, but still as a leader, as a husband, as a father, to command your household, to keep the way of the Lord. We're going to follow the Lord. We're going to be faithful to the Lord. We're going to obey God, to do righteousness, uh, doing what's right, no matter what the world says, no matter what the world thinks, standing up for truth, standing up for beauty, standing up for righteousness, standing up for holiness, um, doing the right thing, no matter what the world says, no matter if people are losing their minds like they are in 2022, to do righteousness and justice, all justice, real justice, not just apparent justice, not just social justice, but justice. That means doing what's right, even if it goes against the flow of everyone um, in their pursuit of whatever social justice platform they're pursuing, real justice. The first thing is to command your household. The second is is like it, it's close to it, it's to teach your household. Um, we don't command without teaching. We can't command without teaching. 
Um, you might hear it in a lot of different circles, either in education or in leadership, start with the why. It's a great idea um, as patriarchs for husbands and fathers, not just explaining here's what we're doing, but why. We're going to honor the Lord. The Lord has called us. The Lord has separated us. He's given us his covenant. He's made us his people. He's given us his promises. He's given us the Redeemer. He's forgiven us our sins. Absolutely communicate the why, but we have to teach our households. We have to teach them what it means to be children of God, what it means to be in covenant with God, what it means to be the people of God. Listen to Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. Talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise. Bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be like frontlets between your eyes. Write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. Always putting forward the Word of God, the promises of God. We talk about them at breakfast. We talk about them at lunch and dinner. We talk about them as we're sitting on the couch. We talk about them in the car, on the way to work or school or on a family vacation. We teach the ways of God to our, to our families, to our household, to our wife, to our kids, to any of those who live in your home, whether they're extended family or, or people that, for whatever reason, um, you teach the, the ways of God and the Word of God to those that you are responsible for. Now, it's also worth saying here and everywhere else that, that this is some of these things are not exclusive for men or patriarchs only. Uh, women, specifically wives, moms, they're not exempt from these things. Um, but they, again, were created as helpers. Help meets for, and, and very specifically, Adam for Adam was created to help meet for him to help him do the things that God had commanded him to do. Not dirty dishes and laundry, but imaging God. Showing the world through the exercising of authority and dominion um, what God is like. Representing God, being his representatives on the planet, showing forth his character, his nature. Um, and so together with our wives, our sisters, our mothers, um, we are co-laborers in the task of dominion, uh, of commanding families and teaching families and teaching kids. But everyone has to be taught. Wives have to be taught. Husbands have to be taught. Kids have to be taught. There's the faithful communication from generation to generation to generation about what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Fathers are teaching sons and daughters. Fathers are teaching wives. Wives are teaching sons and daughters. Mothers are teaching kids. Uh, mothers are, are teaching their daughters. Sisters are teaching sisters. It, it, it's not about walking around and going, I'm in charge. It's, it's about faithfully executing the authority that God has given. Not Again, not so we can lord it over people, but so that we can faithfully do what God has called us to do. Because all of us eventually will stand before the Lord and give an account for those that are under our care. Just like God um, in Genesis chapter 3 when um, the fall has happened, God comes in the garden and he's not calling Eve. He doesn't call Eve to stand in front of him and give an account for her Adam. He calls Adam to give an account for his family, to give an account for him and for Eve. Uh, and so we command our families, we teach our families. Number three, another thing that, that we do as fathers, as patriarchs, uh, we don't provoke our household. Listen, Genesis 3, we also see the, the, the tension between men and women that has existed since the garden. Um, one of the things that I get to do, and unfortunately that's necessary to do in, in life and ministry, is mediate between husbands and wives, sometimes mediate between parents and kids because there's tension, there's problems, um, there's sin that distorts relationships and gets in the way. Um, and, and one of the things that we have to be careful, um, patriarchs, dads, husbands, is not to provoke those, again, under our care. Everyone's going to struggle. Sin, again, twists and distorts it, everything. Sin twists and distorts the way I love my wife and my kids. Sin twists and distorts the way my wife um, honors and respects me. Um, sin twists and distorts the way my kids obey or disobey. And so knowing that, that as I'm commanding and teaching and leading and exercising dominion and authority in my home, um, that I'm doing that in the context and in the presence of sinful people. Right? who aren't always ready to just fall in line and obey the commands of God. 
And so as I teach and love and serve and do all these things, I do it in a way which doesn't provoke. Um, so I have to do it with grace. I have to do it with kindness. I don't do it in my own strength or my own way. However, I want to do it, taking into consideration the, the personalities and, and the strengths and weaknesses of, of our families. We, we don't provoke, whether our, our wives or our kids. Ephesians 6, 4, fathers, don't provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. The way we do it is also important, not just commanding and teaching, but, but commanding and teaching in a way that doesn't provoke that that sinful flesh to kind of buck up against the ways and the things of God. Number three, or that was three. Uh, number four, bless your household. Bless your household. We see it in Genesis 27 as Isaac blesses Jacob. It's a completely different story how Esau gets skipped out on the blessing and him being a profane man, not valuing the blessings of God or the things of God. But Isaac blesses Jacob in Genesis 27. We see Jacob, Israel, then blessing his sons and grandsons in Genesis chapter 49. Um, dads, husbands, fathers, as patriarchs, it's our job to bless those in our household. Again, not just our, our wives and kids, but all of those in our extended family, blessing them. Uh, number 6, 24, the blessing of Moses over Aaron and his sons. Listen to this. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Dads, it's great that we get to pray for our kids. Husbands, it's great that we get to pray for our wives, but don't forget to bless them. Don't forget to speak God's blessing over them. Don't forget to pronounce God's blessing over them. They need to hear the blessings of God. They need to hear the peace of God spoken over them. They need to hear the protection of God spoken over them. Don't just pray for your kids. Bless your kids. Command your family. Teach your family. Don't provoke your household. Bless your household. And then five, lead your household. First Timothy 3, 4 through 5, talking about requirements for elders in the New Testament church. A man must manage his household well, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if anyone doesn't know how to manage his own household, how will he care for the church of God? Men, we have to lead. We have to lead in our families. This is what we're going to do. Not about where we're going to eat on the weekends or making sure that we watch the football game instead of the movie. It's about following God and serving God and, and being faithful to be the people of God in the world that we live in. It's not about getting our way all the time. It's about being faithful. Joshua 24, 15, Joshua's looking at the people of Israel and saying, listen, you figured out what you want to do or not. Uh, if you want to go back and serve pagan gods like your fathers did on the other side of the, uh, of the Jordan, that's fine. But here's what we're going to do, right? Um, he looks out and says, choose this day whom you're going to serve, whether the gods that your father served beyond the, uh, beyond the region, uh, beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you, you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Not, not doing a poll like, hey, where do you want to, you guys want to eat tonight? Or what church should we go to on Sunday? Or, or who should we follow? But listen, we are mills, right? That's how it is in my family. I speak to my daughters this way in a, in a loving but very firm way all the time. <laughs> if you're a Mills, if you're living in this household, this is what you're going to do. We're going to follow the Lord. We're going to serve the Lord. This is not optional for us. Um, there are things that are given for our family, and that's our responsibility, men, to make sure we're leading our families well. So five, lead your family. Six, provide for your household, provide, right? Making sure that our families have everything they need to not only survive, but to thrive. That doesn't mean being wealthy, but working hard so that we have, not only to have, but we have to give, particularly those in our household. First Timothy 5, 8, but if anyone does not provide for his relatives, wife, kids, immediate family, um, in, in, in First Timothy 5, talking about widows, um, if any man doesn't provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his own household, he's denied the faith and worse than an unbeliever. One of the older versions says he's worse than an infidel, right? Um, we're to provide. We're to, we're to provide sustenance, provide a place to live, provide food, shelter, clothing. Doesn't mean we have to provide luxurious vacations and state-of-the-art cell phones and all kinds of toys, but provide for the basic needs. And as a good father, a good husband, then you, you want to bless your family in some ways as much as you can. Uh, do it in uh, sensible ways. We don't want to spoil and just give luxuriously always because that's 
not good because that can also uh, encourage idolatry and train people to make a God out of riches. Um, but we want to provide all of the needs, the wants, uh, within reason, uh, of those under our care. We need to provide for them. Seven, love your household. Um, Ephesians 5, particularly talking about how we treat our wives, men, but I, I think it's okay to say that this extends to our kids and others in our household as well. But Ephesians 5, husbands, love your wives. Love your wives like Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Verse 26, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Love means serving and putting her needs first. It means giving to her and to our house, but also means cleansing our house. We, we love our families, our wives and our kids and our households enough to wash them with the word of God, to make sure that our conversations and our discussions and our home is literally saturated with the word of God so that when we are squeezed by the trials and circumstances and temptations of life, then the word of God, the gospel is literally dripping out and coming out of the seams anywhere because we've been faithfully washing our family with the Word of God. And one of the great ways to love your family, men, is to literally present to them the Word of God. Now, here's a quick caveat. That doesn't mean you have to be on pastor level, theology level, theologian level, um, where you have to know everything about the Word. But I will tell you this, the the commands for us to, to know the Word of God and teach the Word of God are, are not commands for Bible teachers, and they're not commands for pastors, they're commands for fathers. Um, and so sometimes we hide behind having spiritual gifts or not having spiritual gifts, saying things like, well, I don't understand the Bible like you, or I haven't had the opportunity to read the Bible like you. Listen, we're all responsible to know the Word of God. We're all responsible to teach the Word of God. We're all responsible to love the Word of God. And so pastor or no pastor, a theologian or no theologian, Bible scholar or not, teacher or not, you should know and love the Word of God. And you won't know the Word of God if you don't love the Word of God. So we, we love our house. All right, those are some of the roles and responsibilities, loving and leading and teaching and commanding and serving, giving, all of those things. Those, those are the roles and responsibilities of patriarchs. And, and men, we really have the opportunity in these things to, um, to really not only have our identity, but to love our identity. Man, you ought to love your identity as a commander for your family and a good commander a commander who loves, a commander who serves, a commander who gives, a commander who commands in such a way that people love to follow. He is a good commander. Um, you ought to love being a teacher in your family. You ought to love being a provider. You ought to love being a protector. We didn't delve into that one particularly. That, that one we, we talked about a couple months ago um, in, in the coaching. So that go look March uh, 2022 coaching if you want more of the protector idea. Um, but but sure, we ought to, we ought to love our roles um, as providers, protectors, teachers, commanders, leaders, um, and lovers of our household. It's not just roles and responsibilities. They're not just chores. This is who we get to be, right? This is good. This is our calling. This is what God um, has given us. It's a blessing to be a patriarch. So that's the, the, the identity of a patriarch. Roles and responsibilities. Number three, um, the sacrifices of a patriarch. Being a patriarch, man, means that you're going to make a lot of sacrifices. Uh, it means you're going to be consistently putting people um, in front of yourself as more important than yourself. And, and so when talking about the sacrifices of a patriarch, we even go back to the, the sacrificial system of the Old Testament. And it all boils down to one really, really simple thing, and that's obedience. The sacrifices of a patriarch are, are this, obedience to God over everyone and everything else. No matter what, the role and responsibility of the patriarch is to obey God. And as we obey the Father, then all of this other stuff gets fleshed out. Listen to this, Genesis 3, 17. This is God coming and talking to Adam, basically taking Adam to the woodshed in the garden after the rebellion and the fall of mankind. But Adam says, because, or God says to Adam, because you have listened to the voice of your wife, and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. What God is saying to Adam is because you listened to your wife and not me. 
this is what's happened. Um, he didn't come looking for Eve. Eve wasn't responsible in the garden. No matter what happened, no matter what the order happened, the, the picture in Genesis is seems to be that Adam is there present with his wife during everything. And Adam allows this conversation to have, allows his wife to be deceived, allows his wife to partake instead of leading in what I like to, to say is the, the first snake stomping ministry. Um, he's responsible. And, and God says, because you listen to your wife and not me, this is this is what's happened. The ground is cursed because of you. And, and, and that's everything to us because we are men of the earth. Everything we do, man, we do on the earth um, from farming to ranching to uh, to working, to tilling the soil, we are men of the ground. We were taken from the earth, and now the earth is cursed because of us, because of our failure to obey God instead of others. And it's easy to let the pressures and the temptations of the world influence our decisions instead of saying, listen, this is what we're going to do, because God has said. When Jesus was tempted by Satan in the wilderness, each time his response was, it is written. It is written. It is written. It doesn't matter what anyone else says, men. What does God say? What does God require of us? Genesis chapter 16. Abraham listened to Sarai, his wife, and that's how the whole Hagar and Ishmael situation came into being. And then the thorn in his side and his people's side for thousands of years. Now we see Abraham's failure to lead Sarah when Sarah says, hey, I'm not going to have a kid. Have a kid with Hagar. Take her. That's how we're going to do it. Instead of saying, man, God's promised. God's faithful, and God miraculously gave a son to Abraham and Sarah, um, and then gave Abraham more sons with Keturah. Um, God's hand is not short, right? God doesn't have a lack of power. God has made promises. He's going to fulfill his promises. Genesis 22, 1 and 2. After these things, God tested Abraham, said, Abraham, he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a sacrifice, as a burnt offering on the mountains of which I'm going to show you. Um, what it means to be a patriarch is we do the hard things. Uh, we make sacrifices because we obey the Lord. No matter what he requires of us, we obey. No matter what he asks of us, we obey. No matter what he commands us, we obey. That's the sacrifice of a patriarch. We sacrifice what our dreams are, what our desires are. We sacrifice them to the, the revealed will of God. Uh, what everyone else is doing, we sacrifice those things to what God has revealed that he requires from us. How the world spends their money, how the world spends their time, what the world does, none of those things matter. We do what God requires. We do what God commands. We do what God has revealed for us in his will. We could even talk about Ephesians 5 here, the sacrifice, um, uh, where, where, where it tells us to love our wives like Christ loved the church and gave himself. That and is very, very important because loving your wives like Christ loved the church and giving yourselves for your wives are two separate things. They're two separate things because they're connected with and. And what I believe Paul is getting at in Ephesians 5 is the way we love our wives like Christ loved the church is we love God first. No matter what our flesh wants, no matter how we want to be delivered from difficult situations, we submit our will to the will of the Father. Nevertheless, not my will be done, but yours be done. The sacrifices of a patriarch are complete obedience to God, complete obedience to Christ. Number four, I love this part, the blessings of a patriarch. Romans 15, 8, for I tell you that Christ became a servant to the circumcised to show God's truthfulness in order to confirm the promises given to the patriarchs. One of the great blessings, men, in being a patriarch is we get the blessings of being a patriarch. We get to see the faithfulness of God fleshed out in our lives, in the lives of our kids, in the lives of our family. God has given us great and precious promises, 2 Peter chapter 1. And as a patriarch, as a leader, a teacher, commander, lover, servant, giver in our families, we get to see the faithfulness of God just acted out and fleshed out in front of us through our wives and our kids. Um, God confirms the promises he's given to the patriarchs through his great faithfulness. 1 Corinthians 9, 23, I do it all for the sake of the gospel that I might share with them in its blessings. There are manifold blessings of the gospel in our lives, the promises of God that God faithfully executes and performs without fail. 3 John 
1, 4, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. One of the great blessings of being a patriarch is watching your children faithfully serve the Lord. Watching your children faithfully do what God has called them to do. Watching your children obey the things you've taught them. Watching your, your wife and your kids um, serve the Lord in, in amazing and faithful ways. That, that's a blessing of what it means to be a patriarch, to, to be the leader of a family, a family that faithfully executes the will of God in the world. Proverbs 10.1 and 15.20, a wise son makes a glad father. Um, the blessing is to see your kids be fruitful and multiply and, and, and be representatives and faithful representatives and image bearers of God in the earth. God brings about his eternal promises to and through the patriarchs, through men who lead, teach, serve, give f- themselves, give themselves for, sacrifice themselves for, and serve their families. Patriarchs get the joy of watching the goodness and faithfulness of God extend to our kids and our grandkids um, through our lives, our lives with our wives, our marriages, our families. It's an incredible blessing. Deuteronomy 7, 9, know therefore that the Lord your God, he is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. Um, One of the the blessings of, of being a patriarch is to see and know that God is going to fulfill his promise, not just to me, to my kids, my grandkids, but but hundreds of years down the line, um, dozens of generations later, to a thousand generations, um, that God is going to keep his promises, that God is going to build his people, that God's going to create a people for his name, that he's going to glorify his name. He's going to make himself known throughout the earth. And he does it, men, through patriarchs. He does it through faithful men who lead and love and teach and command and serve their families uh, to make sure um, that we are faithfully obeying God and imaging God and and being light in the darkness, salt in the earth. So here's the practical and tactical this month. I want you to raise the banner for the patriarchy. No matter what the world says or how they define it, we must maintain the importance of it, the significance of it, and the faithfulness of what it means to be a patriarch in a God-fearing home, right? This is our battle cry, man. The rise of the patriarchy, right? Um, Understanding that God has called us. Uh, No one else is going to do it. No one else gets to do it. No one else has been equipped to do it. No one else is responsible to do it. We are responsible. We are men of God. We are men who are husbands and fathers and grandfathers. And I can't wait. I'm getting older. Some things suck, right? Some things hurt, and it's not always fun. But one day, the next five to ten years, hopefully, um, to hold my grandbabies and to just to teach my grandkids and to watch my grandkids rehearse and echo back and forth the the faithfulness of God, I'm looking forward to those days. I'm looking for three young men who want to be husbands and want to be fathers and want to faithfully teach and serve their families. And so I can't wait to do that. So, So I want you to... I want you to fight for that, right? I want you to, to understand that that's your role, that, that this is your banner. Um, and this is something to be proud of. This is something to be excited about. This is something to be to be good at, to be a good patriarch, to be a good leader of a family, to be a good provider, to be a good protector, to be a good teacher, to be a good commander, to be a good servant, to be a good giver of yourself and all things, to be a, a good... Wow, so our camera died. My GoPro literally just overheated and died. Not sure what's going on uh, with that, but I do want to finish up uh, this month. We literally had just a a minute or two left. Um, As I was saying, um, this is is what it means to be a patriarch. We, We get to do these things. We get to embrace these things and be good at these things and love these things. And so uh, again, the practical and tactical to all of my patriarchs out there, you know, keep loving, keep teaching, keep leading, keep serving your family faithfully, no matter what the culture says, no matter what the opposition, no matter what your occupation is, how wealthy you are or you aspire to be, remember that, that being a patriarch is your number one calling to faithfully serve the Lord and to all my future 
patriarchs out there. Um, don't wait till you have a wife and kids to start learning, to start walking these truths out in your life. Um, don't wait until you have a family of your own. Uh, get started by attaching yourself to a family, either your family, your, your dad, or maybe a friend's family. Um, learn what it looks like, observe, try to attach yourself in a way so, so you can see how these things are worked out and how they flesh out um, in a real world, uh, in real circumstances, um, in, in real homes with real people, sinful people, imperfect people. Um, but this is the joy of life. Um, this is the, the, the highest calling. Um, it's easy to get distracted by all the things of the world and, and forget that, that there's a beautiful way um, to, to live this life in the context of a covenantal family. And so um, get involved, get attached, and, and again, start imaging and representing and fleshing these things out before a lost and dying world. And every opportunity you have to faithfully engage people who want to go down with the patriarchy, remember that it is an incredible gift from God uh, to love and serve and lead people um, to see the beauty of the gospel of Jesus Christ and to do it in a way which it would almost be impossible to, for people to go, wait, that's a patriarch? That's what it looks like to be a patriarch? Man, that's not at all uh, like what the world says. That's, that's not at all evil or bad or responsible for all the evils in the world. Be a good patriarch. Faithfully represent your God, your King, and exercise dominion in the world that he's called you to. I look forward to connecting with you guys again. Uh, as always, make sure you check out the resources on our uh, website, proverbstriplexclub.com. You can look at our stuff on YouTube, our resources. By all means, join the club on Patreon. And I appreciate your membership. I appreciate your listening. I appreciate uh, all the questions you guys sent in and how we can engage and work through these things together. I pray God's blessings on you as you build your families as good patriarchs. I look forward to connecting with you soon.